be given by Eric Mazur, who is the Balkansky Professor of Physics and Applied Physics at Harvard University. And his hot topic is going to be novel uses of femtosecond laser pulses in biophotonics. In this uh, last talk, and I realize I'm in the not very enviable position of being between you and uh, the end of this session, maybe dinner even, I'd like to return to the subcellular scale because I'd like to give you a taste of some of the really exciting things we can do with femtosecond laser pulses at that uh, scale. Um, femtosecond laser pulses are very short, and because they're very short, they have really high intensity, which is the key point that I would like to exploit in the next 10 minutes. The short, and, and the, the key point actually is that they have high intensity even at low energy. The high intensity is necessary to disrupt materials, that's the part of femtosecond pulses that we'll exploit. Uh, the low energy is important because it allows you to achieve exquisite precision and to limit the disruption to a very small uh, volume. These uh, properties were first exploited a number of years ago by an earlier speaker tonight, Karsten Koenig's group, to obtain cell transfection or the uh, incorporation of nucleic acid into a cell using femtosecond laser pulses. The idea is relatively simple. Take a, a cell incubated in a solution that contains uh, DNA, aim the femtosecond laser pulse at the membrane of the cell, uh, and the high intensity then disrupts the membrane, creating a hole through which the DNA can enter the cell. Now, cell transfection is important for a number of different uh, techniques, gene delivery and therapy, regenerative medicine, as well as maybe in the future the differentiation of stem cells. The goal would be to achieve very low toxicity uh, of any cell transfection technique, a high efficiency, meaning that a large number of the cells get transfected, a high throughput, a large number of them can be transfected in a certain amount of time, as well as low specificity so that many different cell types can be transfected. The standard approaches all have shortcomings in one or more of these uh, criteria. The laser operation, demonstrated a number of years ago, has advantages in the most important categories, such as toxicity and efficiency, but falls short on uh, throughput because you need to transfect a single cell at a time. Two years ago, when we were at Photonics West presenting on a very different subject, a postdoc of mine, and, uh, Alex Heisterkamp, and a graduate student, a former graduate student, Eric Diebold, came up with the idea of using structured plasmonic substrates to scale up the uh, use of femtosecond laser transfection. The idea is to use a structured substrate. The idea was actually born because we were using black silicon, a substrate developed in my lab, to do surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy and to show very high field enhancement factors using uh, those substrate. So for transfection, the idea is use a structured surface covered by a metallic film use femtosecond laser pulses next to induce plasmons in these substrates, and then have the high field intensity at the tip of these, of these pyramids or cones porate the, uh, sub, the uh, membrane of cells. Here's a numerical simulation, uh, simulation that shows the high electric field at the tip of one of these uh, cones under femtosecond illumination. The way we make these substrates, we decided not to use uh, black silicon, but actually to engineer the substrate so that we have more control of the uh, plasmonic enhancement, the density of these points, the separation, and so forth. And we use a technique called um, template stripping. We start with a mask to do photolithography on a silicon substrate, etch the exposed region, then gold coat the uh, silicon with a, uh, coat the uh, silicon with a very thin layer of uh, gold, and then use a glass slide covered with an epoxy to strip the gold layer off. Here's an SEM showing such an engineered uh, substrate. 
We next verified and quantified the field enhancement by looking at two-photon polarization under femtosecond illumination. And as you can see, the blobs at the tips of these pyramids indicate that there's been some two-photon polarization happening. And we confirmed the high local field enhancement near the tips of these substrate. Next, we verified that cells would attach to these substrates. Here you see a human tumor cells that are attached on, on top of these uh, pyramids. And in an experiment, we'll report the details uh, tomorrow, we took a substrate shown here, illuminated the top with femtosecond laser pulses, but the bottom we kept in the dark. And as you can see, only the part that has pyramids on the right-hand side of the substrate, only on, and that part, the cells show uh, uptake of a uh, membrane-staining dye. So that shows very high efficiency and very high throughput, as well as low toxicity, exactly what we want. So full details tomorrow at uh, 3.50. Now, from the surface of the cell, because we've only spoken about the exposure of the cells, cell membrane to femtosecond laser pulse, let's now turn our attention to the bulk. Um, a number of years ago, I was speaking to a colleague at the Harvard Medical School, uh, Professor Don Eng Engber, who is very interested in studying the cytoskeleton, and who asked the question, would it be possible to use laser pulses to measure the viscoelastic properties of individual actin fiber bundles inside a living uh, cell? The requirements to do that would be to have, first of all, submicrometer precision in the bulk, to be able to avoid damage to either the cell membrane or neighboring structures, and also to be, if you want to apply that, not just to actin fibers, but to other structures as well, to be independent of the structure organelle type. Now, if you exploit two photon absorption, you can actually limit the disruption due to a femtosecond laser pulse just to the focal region. So if you focus very tightly into the bulk of a cell, you can keep the intensity at the membrane low enough so that the disruption only happens inside uh, the bulk. Now, the cytoskeleton gives a cell its shape. It's important as a scaffold for different organelles. It is important for migration and a number of other functions in, uh, in the cell. Here you see a uh, cell that, where the actin fiber bundles have been labeled using yellow fluorescent protein. The dark region uh, on the top right is the nucleus of this cell. We can take our femtosecond laser pulse, focus them on a single uh, fiber bundle, disrupt this fiber bundle, and then see it retract over time like a cut rubber band. So this is immediately after the cut. You see the actual width of the uh, cut here. And then over time, um, the, the cell, the, the, the cut broadens due to viscoelastic retraction of, uh, of the two cut ends. We can take this movie that we make, I only show two uh, frames here, and plot the retraction distance as a function of time, fit it with a simple function described in Overdam's uh, spring, and obtain the viscoelastic properties of a single bundle. Now, why is this interesting? This is interesting because the tension in these filaments is regulated inside the cell by myosin motors. So now we can introduce into the cell um, inhibitors of this myosin activity. And indeed, as you can see in this plot, if we add an indirect inhibitor, we see that the cell loses most of its elasticity. If we add a direct inhibitor, all of the elasticity of these uh, fiber bundles are uh, lost. So this can be used as a tool to actually study these properties in great details. Now, in the last few minutes, I see I have a, a little less than two minutes left. I'd like to turn our attention to another part of the cytoskeleton, namely the microtubules, which when they're cut, they don't retract elastically. They actually depolymerize from the cut ends. Microtubules are especially important during cell division. You can see a cycle here starting at 7 o'clock and ending at 5 o'clock. And we're particularly interested in the spindle that the microtubules form during the metaphase shown at the top. In green, you see the spindle formed by the microtubules. In blue, you see the chromosomes that in later phases are then pulled apart by uh, the spindle. Some of the questions are, is it possible to actually determine both the polarity and the length of these microtubules in the spindle? So what we did was observe the depolarization after creating planar cuts, as shown here, in a 3 d spindle. 
We looked at the spindles from the frog eggs because they are large compared to those in human cells and yeast cells, as you can see in this plot. Here you see one of these spindles in a, floating in a solution immediately after the cut, which launches a, launches a depolarization wave towards the pole of the spindle. We can pre create two cuts in order to, provide, to obtain observation on the mean lengths. And just to make a very long story short, but tell you some of the exciting things we can do is it is determine the spindle organization. And one of the things that we found out was that both the polarity distribution and the length distribution vary across the cell. You see here the microtubules that are oriented towards the right. There are, of course, just as many oriented towards the left, but have been omitted from this figure. And we find that the ones in the center are the longest. Towards the edge, they're much shorter. Also, the ones pointing towards the right there are many more of them. As you can see, 70% of the microtubules near the left spindle are pointing towards the right. And, of course, the opposite, 100% minus 70%, 30% is true on the right side. Full details on Monday in an invited paper in the session shown on the screen. So, in summary, we can manipulate on a sub-micrometer, sub scale using femtosecond laser pulses, penetrate in the bulk without compromising the viability. And I showed you very briefly two applications, one to perform high-efficiency, high-throughput transfection, and the other to study spindle mechanics during uh, division. So I'd like to end by saying I think femtosecond laser pulses are just a great tool for manipulating the machinery of life. And if you're interested in more information, that's the URL of my website. Thank you very much.